Hey, welcome everybody. Good evening. What do you think of that music, Jack? I love it. What do you think of these hardcore tea partiers? They could be sitting on a deck or out in a boat or doing something. And where are they? They're at the Yankee Smith. Give yourself a hand. It's on the that you don't know. It's a holiday week. Jack, I'm playing that music, uh, Survivor, uh, I'm the Tiger, and it's on my uh, iPhone. We're going to talk about that tonight. For sure, your iPhone or the sun? We're going to talk about Apple iPhone and their innovation and why free markets lead to that. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. It's the East Metro Tea Party event. Of course, we don't have meetings because meetings are boring. We have programs. So thank you very much for coming. Here is tonight's event at... Six o'clock, we started the social hour, and we're a little bit behind. I hate being behind, it's the military me, but we're a little bit behind. We like to start about 6.30 time frame to do the one minute moments, so we're gonna start that here shortly. At seven o'clock, we'll pledge allegiance to our wonderful flag. We'll do a quick prayer by Jack Rogers, and then we're gonna get into uh, economic independence. Our theme today is independence. Imagine that, Jack. <laughs> I can't, I've been married for 40, 40 years this month. <laughs> <laughs> then at 710, our constitutional historian is going to talk about the unknown history of the Declaration of Independence. That's going to be really interesting. I can't wait to hear that one. And at 720, we're going to do a check on learning because that's the way to do things, to know that you're actually paying attention. So take notes. And, and watch for the sponsor of the political entertainment. That's right. This is a new sponsor, great sponsor, good people. Adequate. 720, <laughs> 720, we're going to play by, back by popular demand. Who wants to be a millionaire before taxes? <laughs> We, tell us, tell everybody what happened at the South Metro with that. What happened for the South first time Metro ever? Tea Party, our brand new Tea Party unit. Give them a hand, they're right over here. Yeah, we actually had a college student win the million dollar prize. The million dollars. The million dollars. All the way. Yeah, of course our sponsor can't afford the million dollar prize, so you won a free lunch at Subway. Yep. <laughs> And we're going to talk more about the South Metro when we get into the toolbox a little later because right. there's some exciting news about that South Metro. Now, what I'm really excited about going on with our theme of independence is at 7.40, we have our own Craig Shorts. Raise your hand, Craig. He's going to talk about individual rights. I can't think of a more appropriate subject on our celebration of the 4th than that. At 8.10, we'll go with What's Hot on YouTube. And I am, I'm going to apologize right off the bat because I know every minute is so important to you at the East Metro Tea Party, but I'm gonna end it a little shortly today. We're not gonna go to nine o'clock. We're gonna end around 8.40, um, but the after party behind me will go on until midnight. And then you can go up to your cabin and go fishing. If you have not gone and checked out the buffet, we have uh, a Tex-Mex buffet tonight for $10. And I was informed that Carnitas is not on that, even though that's what they sent me in the email. I think they've got a ground beef substitute. But anyhow, Dave, good? Yeah, I, I think it's clearly superior to the Italian one, so it's good. <laughs> and that's coming from a guy with three plates sitting in front of him. <laughs> Jack, what do we have to cover here? Well, there's a couple things we always like to do, and that is our little housekeeping thing. And that is to say thank you uh, to the people helping us tonight. First of all, the manager on duty tonight is Travis. The bartender who's mixing the heavy drinks uh, is Nick. And the wait staff is Marky, <laughs> Haley, and Paige. Please do two things. Give them a little tip and give them a big hand. Now, quick show of hands. Who's never been to a tea party event before? Don't be shy, raise your hand. Oh my God, every time. Jack, wow. that's so great. Welcome. Yes, thank you so much yeah. for coming. Woo. How did you, you ask a couple how, how they heard of it? I did, I actually talked to these people. One person read about us in the Pioneer Press. The Pioneer Press? Well, they spoke about you and I, Jake, in the tea parties? It took them a couple months. He's the I April. see, I see, okay. <laughs> Uh, then we have some referrals here, um, but if this is your first T40 event, please come see Jack and I afterwards and tell us how we reached you because we want to make sure we keep growing as a T40.
Quick show of hands, anyone never been to a political event before? Ooh, I usually get at least one. Well, don't worry, tonight's not a political event. We like to have a fun time. Politics is boring. But, for those that are new to the Tea Party, Jack, let's tell them who the Tea Party is, what we stand for. I think we should. I think it's very important for you to really understand what we stand for is a good way to vet any candidate. Because we don't support a party, we support the issues and the values that are important to us individually. So the first one are free markets. We want any of you who want to take the risk to be in a business or to do something to get the reward. That shouldn't be passed off to the government, shouldn't be impugned by the government, shouldn't be hammered down by the government. You see any of that taking place in this state? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. what's happening to the companies that are feeling the heat from that? Bye-bye. Goodbye. And what's our governor and the administration here doing? Nothing. Goodbye. They don't care. Free markets are important. That is a key thing, key thing to ask your people that are running for an office. What else, Jay? Jack, you know, my wife and I, every month we sit down and we balance a checkbook. Balance our budget. Your own? Well, yeah, mine and various other ones. Government wants to be in the middle of that too, don't they? Jack, we (laughs) expect government to do that. They haven't done that. And that's the other thing we stand for is fiscal responsibility. Hey, we understand. You're going to hear about how we founded this nation. We understand that there is a role for government. But guess what? That government should live within, within its means with the money that it raises. And last but not least, Jack, what's the last one that we stand for? Our individual liberties. Constitutionally limited government. That's where you need to have your own constitution and read it and know when they're stepping on it. Okay? Second Amendment, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, all of them are important. You can get calendars in the back with Dan. He's got it on there. But this is important. This is another way to vet the candidate. Ask them, what does shall not infringe mean? See what kind of an answer you get. Let's go on, Jake. Jack, you asked me before coming here, what the heck's that Twitter thing? It took me about 20 minutes to explain it. Jack still doesn't understand it. But for those of you that do understand what Twitter is, it's a social media site, you can use the hashtag East Metro Tea Party to tell the media what's going on here tonight. Because you know what? They don't like to cover the Tea Party too often, but they also hate missing the story. So tell the media using Twitter, use hashtag East Metro Tea Party, tell them the good things that are happening here tonight. Do we have twits here? Is that that's what you call them, right, Jay? <laughs> Not quite, Jay. All right. All right, we're going to start with One Minute Moments. We've adopted this from the North Metro Tea Party. This is a chance for you to tell us anything that's on your mind, especially if you have a Tea Party-friendly business, you want to promote your, your business because we believe in free, free economics. Come up here, tell us about your business. If you are running for an office, Warren, you need to get up here and tell us what office you're running for. Give me a hand. Not yet, not yet. But you're not going to dodge me here. And I know there's going to be a couple other announced candidates in this room. I know that's going to happen. Maybe not this month. Uh, explain your, uh, promote a separate tea party event. I know there's one big one that's going to happen in July. Actually, a couple of big ones in July. I hope they come up here. And then also, if you want to vent your frustration about Governor Dayton or President Obama or John Boehner or, or Marco Rubio. We don't have that much time, time, Jake. Okay. <laughs> come up here, but we'll make sure you stay within one minute. So, to kick things off, I am going to bring the newest Tea Party organizers in the state of Minnesota, the place that Jack and I went down and helped out for the first one, the South Metro Tea Party. Come on up here, girls and guys. Come on up. This was a fun... All right, Jack, uh, hand them the microphone in. Are you ready? Kind of turn around, I'll I'll hand you the mic, and you kind of give me your name. Okay, pass it down. You have to move over a little bit. <laughs> I'm Trisha. I'm right there. All right. <laughs> oh, I don't see myself anywhere else. Oh. Anyway, um, I am um, one of the founders of the South Metro Tea Party, and we meet. Yay! No. Yeah. We are going to be meeting the fourth Tuesday of every month, and we just found a new site. We started out at Stefano's, but we outgrew it in one night. <laughs> So we're really excited about that. That's, that's why I put that picture on the right here. We 
No joke. We actually had people sitting on the floor. It was so packed. It was very packed. So now we're going to be at Bogart's in Apple Valley. So pass us on. Hi, I'm Stephanie Michaelis from the Bloomington area. I'm friends with Trisha and all these people here for about three years and moving on to the next step and trying to involve more people. So join us at the next tea party. Hi, I'm Joel Martinsky. I'm also friends with these fabulous people. Uh, we're all from the 56 Club and uh, so we studied the Constitution and we uh, you know, what brought it about. And so that's where we're Hi, John Cruz. I'm a constitutionalist, and I'm very excited about our about our new tea party. And I hope we can uh, teach a lot more people about the Constitution, a precious document. Come on over here, see you. Hi, I'm Mel Henschel, and uh, I'm just busy learning what I didn't learn in school, because <laughs> they didn't teach me, and uh, so I'm, I got a lot of catching up to do, but I'm catching up fast, and I'm trying to do the best I can to teach my congressmen and my legislators, because they didn't learn it either. <laughs> we have to see you all down at South Metro down at Bogarts. Hi, I'm Leslie Henschel, and when we met at Stefano's, we were hoping for 50 people. We had over 150 people show up. That's awesome. It was good and it was bad. It was so hot. <laughs> How hot was it? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it was so hot. Sweat was dripping off of you. I know it. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so we have a gift for you. Oh, 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 oh. Model it quickly. Model it for Yeah. <laughs> you gotta do something about it. And, um, we all gotta work toward it. Thank you very much. Give a round of applause. Jeez. Jack is gonna use that. Especially you stay up here. Alright. Uh, where do you have to use Jack's? Alright, well, this is the newest South Metro Tea Party. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later in our presentation about what they're doing, but. Um, let's go on. Trish has actually got a business she's going to promote. I do have a business. It's called Second Amendment Marketplace, and I make jewelry out of, and have one here, of spent um, gun shells casings, and I go and find like antique jewelry and all that kind of fun stuff. And the best part is I roll up a little tiny Second Amendment and put it inside of every single one of them. So I'm selling those back at a table back there, and I can change it from a necklace into a keychain, into a zipper pull very easily, so I would like it if you would come back and visit me. Here's uh, house rules. If you want to speak, see where Stephanie is. Raise your hand, Stephanie. Just stand over there. I'll see you in the queue. <laughs> Stephanie, you're up next. Hello, everybody. Uh, how many are familiar with Common Core and the, and the fight that we've got going on here in the state and in this country? Yeah, but 45 of the states have it. Uh, they say Minnesota doesn't, but my daughter is 17. We've been through Bloomington Public Schools, through fifth grade, pulled out to charter schools, and now she's completely pulled out to homeschooling online. 
So what I'd like to do is offer my services from a private tutoring standpoint. I know we've got a lot of political battles to fight, but in the meantime, we've got kids out there that are in the school system or being bombarded every day with uh, curriculum that does not make sense. So I'll leave some brochures over here. I'm actually out of the Bloomington area, but happy to uh, discuss with you if I need to travel somewhere because we've got to teach these kids uh, some of the true principles of this country. Thanks. Thank you. Real quick on the Common Court today, they said that uh, the states have to uh, uh, come up and submit to it or they're going to withhold federal funds and that the kids will have to learn the EPA manual before they graduate from high school. Nothing about the Constitution, nothing about great um, authors, nothing about math, etc. EPA manual, that's sick. Dan, come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan Pillow, spelt backwards as all lip. For more, for more than 40 years, I've been trying to educate people the principles of our rights. On the table, I got the 24th edition of the Freedom Calendar with how to use your rights. If you don't know them, you don't use them. If you don't use them, you lose them. Now, we got to teach people a four or five. Do you understand what I mean by four or fives? Five words or less, five seconds, fifth grade level, and five times. And I'd be willing to wager anybody, most of you people in this room don't know how to use all your rights. If you don't know them, that calendar is the best educational tool in 200 years. One guy gave a group $100,000 because of the calendar in California. Now we made it, they put their name on it, and he got a $100,000 donation. So that tells you something. Now, come back and pick up the literature, because I got news for you. We have to educate the people with four fives because we've been dumbed down so bad there's no words for it. Come down and see us. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dan. All righty. Introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Warren Wessel, and I'm, uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm, uh, I'm with Cole Banker Vernon. I'm a realtor. I've been a realtor in the East Metro since 1988. And uh, so if you need to move, give me a call. Also, I'm running for city council in the uh, city of Maplewood. For those of you who are familiar with uh, Maplewood government, it's been a little rocky the last five, six years. And uh, I'm hoping to bring a little common sense and uh, uh, kind of a new beginning to Maplewood. There's actually two guys in there that are uh, not up for election this year, that are pretty common sense, and I'm open to join them. Now, I'm running against DFL-endorsed candidates. Uh, Kathy Juneman is the incumbent, and then there's another gal, I forget her name. And of course, our mayor is not gonna try to get reelected after his uh, garbage fiasco. Um, I, I didn't really get very political until about uh, 2008 when I started to see the way government was trying to dictate how us as individual citizens are supposed to live our lives, how they set the laws to manipulate us into doing what they think is best, and uh, you know, realizing all they're doing is paying back the bureaucrats that got them in. So we, uh, you know, this Tea Party is a great deal, and it's, I was amazed how people just wanting freedom were so vilified in the press and by Hollywood and all that, it just, that's what really woke me up, is the people that just want to express freedom and are tired of the government taking our money and giving to other people, they, they think deserve it. That's not what we're based on. And on Independence Week, we really all have to speak up, regardless of what anybody says. And they say local government is the best place to start, so, that's why I'm going to give it a shot, and hopefully anybody that lives in Maplewood, if there is any of you, uh, please keep me in mind. August 13th is the primary election. Uh, my name is Warren Wessel, and I'm running for city council. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Uh, my name is Herman Cashmark. I'm from Corcoran, Minnesota, way on the other side of town. Um, I want to tell you about, I'm not telling you anything by the way, except togetherness and cohesiveness for all of our groups that come election time. We all got to pull together. Guess who else does that? The Democrats. 
Anyway, had a little interesting experience over the weekend. I was listening to Sue Jeffers talk about uh, what's the biggest issue that's confronting the country today. And she had lots of people calling in saying this and that and everything like that. And I didn't have a phone line or whatever at the time. So I wrote a letter to Bob Davis. And I, that was uh, yesterday morning. And uh, I told him, I said, the biggest thing in this country that needs to be fixed is morality. Because once you fix morality, you fix it all. And uh, I woke up this morning kind of early and I thought, the radio was on. I just don't see her well anymore. And I thought, gosh, I heard that line. Where did I hear that line before? My gosh, the next sentence was, that's what I wrote. Well, he wrote the whole dog on the radio this morning. So about, about morality. So that's my message for today. And maybe I am selling something. Like I said, togetherness. We all have to pull together come election time. Praise the Lord. I'm not up here. I'm Belle, and I'm from the 56 Club in Eden, Constitutional Club. But I'm not up here for myself today. I recruited three people from Cottage Grove that had never been to a tea party, and she's a small business owner, and she sells on Glenn Beck's Marketplace. She's, she owns a PF Pillows. Can you stand up? embarrassed to, to come up, but I, I told her she should promote her business. That's right. Paulette, well, could you come up here for just one minute? Just for a second. Come on up. Carmen, please, just for a short moment. Okay? Jack, she's never going to come back now. Oh, no, she will. Yes, Dress this guy with a headband <laughs> That's three of us, then. But just look at these people for a minute. These are great customers, aren't they? Yo, see this? She needs your business. She's part of this family. Give her an order. Okay, go ahead and sit down. <laughs> Greg Ryan. This will be the last two. Last two cut out. Okay, well, we got a scheduled one right after Greg. Good evening. My name is Greg Ryan. I am uh, the owner of Ryan Plumbing and Heating in St. Paul on University Avenue. We've been there for over 60 years. I've uh, spoken to a couple of the uh, tea party meetings in the past. Um, <clears throat> My dad died in 1984, that's when my brother and I took over the business, so I've got almost 30 years, in 2014 will be 30 years experience in running a business, and I've owned some rental property before. Uh, as of recent, last three or four years, I've gotten a little bit more politically active, and I have been seeing the degradation of our government and its effects on you all. You all um, are a benefit to all businesses including mine. And what's happening is I'm trying to sell up while you guys are telling me I can't afford it. I try to say to you, you're going to be able to pay for this in the long haul on a higher efficient system or a higher efficient AC, heating or whatever. Your answer to me is I can't afford it and I know why. It's because our government has been extracting more money from you, the taxpayers, which is hurting the person sitting next to you is hurting me and all other businesses that are contributing to our national uh, system of running. We are contributing to the pool and more people are extracting from the pool where it's less sustainable. So um, I'm just going to remain active in um, politics and talking and stuff like that. So. By some far-reaching chance, you might see my name somewhere. Um, you know, support me and or support the people that believe in free market capitalistic values. Thank you very much. Okay, the last one, Jake, is a friend of mine. His name is Andy Selig. And one thing the Democrats have done to us 
over the years as they cons consistently keep filing lawsuits and lawsuits and briefs, etc. Well, this man and his team is doing that on our behalf. Andy, I hate to say this to you, you got a minute, and then I got to come up to the mic up. But you got to make sure they know that you're coming over to the North Metro, and um, give them how to get a hold of you. Come on up, give Andy a big hand. One minute. One minute. He always does this to me. Well, the reason I wanted to come tonight is we're in the middle of a very important lawsuit, and that lawsuit directly affects the Tea Party. It's a lawsuit that was that the government of Minnesota, the state of Minnesota, and it came down through Joe Mansky. Do you all know Joe Mansky, the Ramsey County Elections Director? They came up with an order right before the 2011 election banning Tea Party t-shirts. Right, so you couldn't walk into the voting booth wearing Tea Party t-shirts. You couldn't walk into the voting booth wearing please ID me buttons. You couldn't walk in um, and wear uh, Ron Paul uh, shirts or any kind of political expression. The Minnesota statute says it bans political and campaign material, right, within 100 feet of the polling place. What we're complaining about is not the campaign material. We're complaining about the word political and what that does to suppress expression. Uh, Sue Jeffers is one of our plaintiffs, um, as well as numerous other groups. But I want to tell you, this is going to be appealed to the United States Supreme Court in 30 days. Our attorneys are working on this at Mormon and Cardall. Do you all know Mormon and Cardall in Minneapolis? Uh, Jack and I have a scheduled call with Eric Cardall tomorrow. This is, a, again, it's a pro bono uh, lawsuit. Eric Cardall was the lead attorney in Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. Does anybody recall that decision? That was a decision uh, that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they won. And that was Greg Wurzel challenging it. You know Greg Wurzel? Yes. Right? Okay, that's who represented Greg Wurzel. And what they did in that case is they went up, and the canon, canon 5 of the Code of Judicial Conduct, governs judicial elections, right? So they said freedom of, they couldn't raise money for political candidates. They couldn't even comment on disputed legal and political issues. How the hell are you gonna run for office if you can't even comment on disputed legal and political issues? You can't even talk. You can't talk and you, can and you can't raise money. He challenged it, went all the way to the US Supreme Court and they won. Huge victory. That's the kind of attorneys that we have representing us. They think this case is prime for an appeal. Now, uh, to the US Supreme Court. The Supreme Court only hears a couple percent of all the cases that get appealed. They think this stands a good chance. But let me just touch on this here. We had a split decision in the Eighth Circuit. It was a two to one decision. It went to an en banc request to be heard in front of the whole Eighth Circuit. Two of the judges uh, wanted to hear the case on an en banc. So that was rejected. So now it's going to the US Supreme Court. But the suit stems from the Secretary of State circulating election guidance to ban Tea Party t-shirts and other apparel to remove or cover up uh, under threat of misdemeanor. There was a whole bunch of us through Election Integrity Watch. The Tea Party is also part of Election Integrity Watch. By the way, that's where we got our t-shirts from, and that's who challenged the initial lawsuit. I was told to remove my t-shirt in Eden Prairie. Started a whole rigmarole because I said, I'm not taking off my Tea Party t-shirt. Put me in jail, lock me up. I ain't taking it off. And you know what they said? You can't vote. The head election judge, Ann Higgins, came over and said, you can't vote. Well, there was a court order right before that said, you have to let them vote or you're going to be charged with a misdemeanor. And I said, charge me whatever you want. I ain't leaving until I vote. Sorry, Mr. Sheelick, you can't vote. I called my attorney. My attorney came down. All the news media showed up. If you watch Channel 9 News that night, you would have saw that. Okay. And a lot of people took their shirts off. Right? I wasn't going to take my shirt off. I didn't care what had to be done. So, so what happens now? We're appealing this thing. Other states, Connecticut and Arizona, had the same problem. They were trying to ban conservative... Uh, groups uh, suppress their, just like the IRS is targeting uh, Tea Party groups, right? By the way, Election Integrity Watch, the group that we were working with through the Please ID Me buttons and the Tea Party t-shirt, guess what happened to them? They were audited by the IRS. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so in summary here, our practical position is that this is another case of government infringement on First Amendment speech rights that is happening across the country for national politicians from uh, uh, Obama, Franken, Schumer, all the way down to Minnesota officials and all the way down to Ramsey County. That's how this stuff gets pushed down. So this particular suit may be best ideal for the U.S. Supreme Court. It is clear statutory language, a written policy by the state that precise actions taken by election officials and plaintiffs who have been directly harmed. In short, this is the close, in short, Minnesota statute is an attempt to wrap the force of law around the demonization of conservatives and tea parties. 
as such, we, do, we must do everything within our reach in this timely opportunity to have the Supreme Court weigh in on our side. In order to increase the chances of having the Supreme Court hear our appeal, we need amicus briefs to be filed with the court making the case of why it is important. That's why I'm here tonight. I'm asking Jack Rogers and Jay to be a part of the Tea Party uh, amicus brief, filing an amicus brief, which just stands for Friend of the Court Briefs. We're also uh, in touch with the Rutherford Institute and Jenny Beth Martin and Cindy Pugh. Jenny Beth Martin runs the National Tea Party. We have a call with her later in the week. And Cindy Mavis. And Cindy Mavis. So, so we're asking for, here, here's why I'm here tonight. And we have a call to start all that process. It's $5,000 for filing fees. Our attorneys are doing a pro bono. Okay, what does that 5000 do? It covers filing fees and copying costs. Copying costs to the U.S. Supreme Court are high. Doesn't sound like, it sounds like a lot of money. They have their own printing, their own printing company, their own everything, everything's gotta be the same font, the same, everything's gotta be the same, in, in, in perfect order. Now, an amicus brief is about $2,500 for an amicus brief, and we're hoping to get three or four of them. So out of here, I'm committing, so we're, if, if, between the filing fees and a $2,500 uh, amicus brief, we're hoping that Jack and his guys can come up with. Um, I'm willing to raise two-thirds of that money myself, and I'm hoping that the Tea Party can raise one-third of that money. And this sounds like a fair deal to me. It takes money, it takes time and effort to go raise money, but this is a very important case. So, Jack, I want to thank you for giving me the time. I went three or four minutes. I'm probably never going to hear from Jack again. But... <laughs> <laughs> if you don't show up on your left, It's uh, incredible to meet somebody that puts it on the line, no matter what. Uh, and we got some strong people, but we got to keep moving. But make sure you get his website and get this stuff. This is powerful stuff to have in your personal library. I need a proud vet in the room to raise your hand. Anyone a veteran? There you go, guy with the flag. Come on up here. Let's lead the, the group of the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What's your name? Thank you. David. David, in what branch? Uh, my first time here. I'm with the what, what branch of service? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, U.S. Navy. U.S. Navy, give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Can you rise for the uh, a prayer? It's not right unless uh, you know a lay pastor stands behind a pulpit, right? <laughs> anyway, bow your heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you honor us, you guide us, you give us great opportunities. Please work within us. Help us understand that problem of morality. Help us all be examples of what needs to change. We ask that you abide with us here and as we go through the week. And we thank you for this wonderful celebration of the independence of this great nation that you've given us the responsibility to care for. So tonight be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. Let's get started with our Independence Day theme. For the first people, or for people that first uh, come into the East Metro, uh, let me start that over again. People that are coming to the East Metro for the first time, we'd like to have two educational periods. And both are 10 minutes long because we figure anything longer than that is probably hard to listen to, especially when the weather's so nice outside. So we do one on economics. We start with where the debt's at today. We drive home an economic theme, and then we go to some kind of historian theme, usually about the Constitution. This month will be about the Declaration of Independence. I own an investment advising firm, so I speak often on the debt. And uh, I always show this chart whenever I speak to Tea Party Group, show us where the current debt is. Now, we're in a really interesting period where we have had the debt stagnate for the last two months, which is really rare. We're right now at about 16.7 million, or million dollars. <laughs> Funny, 16.7 16, 16 billion. I'm sorry. 
six, is it really trillion? Wow, $16.7 trillion. This uh, annual uh, deficit. It would be okay if I stay up here. <laughs> that, that was my joke. I was going to see my humor. <laughs> Uh, this year we have a projected deficit, fiscal year 2013, which uh, we just entered in the last quarter of, uh, of between about 700 billion and 1 trillion. I always leave the high figure up there because we are going on the fifth year straight of over a trillion dollars that the, the federal budget cannot be balanced. So we overspend by a trillion dollars. We also have a monetary base that's increased by just a little 100 billion dollars in the last month. That's all the cash that's flowing around the system. You know, when they talk about inflation, that is inflation. It means increasing the monetary supply. And if you don't know much about the monetary base, it was about a third of that no more than six years ago. So, I always have a stress ball with me when I speak about economics because, boy, these things are painful to listen to. I, I always throw this out, but today we're not gonna talk about a very depressing issue. We're gonna talk about economic freedom. Going right with our theme. What is economic independence? So I thought I'd cover, real shortly, the tenets of free enterprise system. So in order to have a free inter enterprise system, you need to have economic freedom, you need to have incentives, you need to have competition, voluntary exchange, and private property. Now, the way I explain economic freedom is the ability to start a business. How many business owners do we have in this group? All right, see, you can start a business, and that's actually pretty rare when it comes to history. In fact, even in modern day economies, being able, just an average person to start a business is actually quite rare. We have that kind of freedom in this country. How about obtaining wealth? I mean, we don't even think about that, you know, because we're Americans, but that's actually pretty rare in the context of history. The ability to obtain wealth, the ability to shop. I know there's a lot of women in here that like to do that, my wife included. But when you go shopping, the ability to freely choose what you want to purchase. Freedom of speech, the ability to get up here and promote your business and talk about what you do, the ability to market and advertise, and the ability to own property, all parts of economic freedom. Now we see that attack by government, but that's not the role of government, and Dave's gonna talk about this a little later. The role of government actually is outside of this. This is just a natural occurring thing in freedom. People will do this. Government's real role is to actually provide a common defense. You know how hard it is to do business when you could be bombed or be attacked? I was a, I'm an Iraq war veteran, and it was really interesting to me in Basra, southern Iraq, to see all the uh, oil that uh, would leave that port, uh, Umm Qasr port, and it, I think it could carry like seven tanker tanks, or seven tanks, and... Um, there's only one port that was open because the threat of insurgency. And they were burning off natural gas uh, to the tune of over a million dollars a day because they feared that it was unstable and no one really wanted to invest in that economy. So that's one thing we asked the government to do is provide for common defense, allow those markets to be free. We also asked them to enforce contracts. Uh, there's gonna be a natural uh, a bargaining between these parties in a free system, a free society, and we ask government be the arbitrator of fairness in that. Protect property. You know, there is a free market viewpoint to that, but you know, to a certain extent, we ask for the police in our local government to uh, make sure that our property is not harmed by another individual. And then last but not least is to protect liberty and make sure that this stuff is able to occur. Now, like I said before, Government doesn't always stick outside of that. They sometimes intervene. And one example I like to talk about in economic freedom is what we see here in Woodbury. I call it the Woodbury problem. I, I like beer. I'm guessing a couple people out there like beer. I see Nate's drinking one. I always thought, you know, a brew pub would be perfect for Woodbury, right? You guys know what a brew pub is? It's like a, like microbrewery, craft brewery. They primarily just do beer and you come there and you drink. And maybe they have a small menu. But you know what government does nowadays is they get into the marketplace and they create barriers. Like in Woodbury, you have to pay $10,000 to have a liquor license. Imagine you want to start a small brew pub. That $10,000 is pretty expensive. Here in Oakdale, it's only $2,500. And how about the food to beer ratio? You guys ever heard of this 50-50 rule? They do in Woodbury. 
So essentially, if you're not selling the equivalent amount of tickets in food as you are in alcohol, you can no longer do business. It's against the regulations in the city. And who really gets hurt in the end when government steps outside its bounds? Yeah, it's in the people, the customers, and the people that actually could make a good business and provide other things to the economy. Another thing that's necessary in a free enterprise system are incentives. It seems to me today we talk about profits like they're a bad thing. But profits are not a bad thing. Do you tell your kid not to study? Do you tell your kid not to strive for good grades? Why? Why does he strive for those good grades? Because in the end, he hopes to have a good job, go to a good college, right? He's incentivized by making a better lifestyle for him. And that's what profits are. But you know what? Businesses don't only do things for profits. Sometimes they do it because they want to uh, get more vacation time. And uh, you know that's just another form of being paid as a businessman is you can vacation more often. You, ha you have a flexible schedule as a business owner. Some people want that, that's their incentive. Or how about make a change, make a difference in society? When I talk about make a difference, I always think, the first thing that comes to my mind is this guy right here. I mean, how much has life changed since that smartphone, since Apple came out with that iPhone? And my wife just got the Samsung S4. Apparently, this isn't the best phone anymore. We're gonna talk about the next slide, the competition. But, I mean, what a wonderful, device that's now uh, given to people and, and Apple forever will make a difference in my life because of that product. Another one I think about is these two guys. Imagine you lived in California and your family lived in New York. <laughs> How painful it is to go visit your relatives, but nowadays, what is that, a four hour flight, four or five hour flight, you can get to your relatives over across the other coast. So it's a wonderful thing to have these incentives to make a difference, to get profit. Um, another tenet of the free enterprise system is competition. We want sellers continuously trying to struggle to attract customers. And what that does is it produces better products and services. It increases efficiency, which actually brings down prices over time. It improves labor and increases our standard of living in the United States. And when I think of competition, I think of, I think of the American experiment in the 70s with cars as compared to what was going on in the Soviet Union. Because in the Soviet Union, you didn't have a lot of options when you wanted to drive a car. But in America, you had plenty of options. Colors, styles, engines. That's good, we want competition. We don't want a state-run uh, enterprise. Another tenet of the free market system is voluntary exchange in commerce. For commerce to take, pl take place, you want you want to look at someone else's item and say, you know what, that's more valuable to me than my dollars, and vice versa. In order for that commerce to take place, that person selling that item must think your dollars are more worthy of his, or, or more, worth more to him than his item. And I like to use my favorite comments to explain this. Oh, yeah. Does that sound like Obamacare? I don't know. I like to use my favorite economist, Jeffrey Tucker of the Mises Institute, to explain this point. This is a great video if you've never seen it. And I can give you my most recent example. Actually, last night at 10 o'clock, I went into Taco Bell with $1.99 in my pocket. And I looked up at that menu and I thought, is there anything in this menu that's worth to me more than what I have in my pocket? I looked up and I saw that entry reader, which brought back memories from childhood. And I could practically taste it. And of course, the picture was better than the reality. Uh, inevitably, but the reality is pretty great. And also, you can't eat a picture, so we don't complain. <laughs> so I said to the lady, I said, this, I have a dollar running out of my pocket, but, and it's worth a lot to me in many ways, but your entry reader is worth even more to me than what I own. What about you? What's your sense? Is your entry reader Worth, I know it's worth a lot to you, but do you think that my money might actually be worth even more than your rich reader? And she said to me, you know, I'm so glad you brought up this point, because it is in fact worth more to me than my rich reader. And I said, well, why don't we, why don't we just exchange? And that way, you will get a gift of my money, which is worth more than your rich reader, and I will get a gift, which is your rich reader, which is worth more than my money. And she said, that is a beautiful idea. 
And we exchanged with each other. I handed her the money, she handed me this little plastic tray of mushy you know, beans. With, um, and we looked at each other's eyes, and I said to her, thank you. And she said to me, no, thank you. <laughs> and it was wonderful. And we were so happy afterwards. So much happier than we were before. <laughs> And if you could repeat this a trillion times in the course of an hour all across the world, what would happen? What would happen? The world would be a very beautiful place. And that is, in fact, what is happening all the time. And that is the source of our happiness. So, would you like to see him in Minnesota? Yeah. <laughs> We're thinking of bringing him in. I love that. The last part is private property. See, businesses must have access to the means of production. And that's where I'm going to leave it off today. Because right now we're shaping for August. It could be September. But we're going to do the difference between capitalism and Marxism. And that's really where the big divide is. The, the ability to have access to means of production. If you want more on subjects of economics, you can follow my Twitter handle at jduesenberg. That's Twitter, Jack. That's that social media site. <laughs> or my website, jdfunds.com. I often write about this subject. Now, moving on from our subject of independence, we're bringing up our own Dave Benner, our constitutional expert. He's going to talk about the unknown history of the Declaration of Independence. Dave. Howdy. So it is an honor, as it always is, to be among patriots today, and it is a darn important day in our nation's history, in the, the, in the history of our republic, in fact, because today is the day in 1776 that the Richard Henry Lee resolution passed the Continental Congress, which declared that all the states' ties to Great Britain were completely dissolved, leaving us with free and independent states. In many ways, today is our independence day, and John Adams uh, mistakenly at the time thought that it would be. In a letter that he had wrote to Abigail Adams, he said, the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts, acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forevermore. So we can see that John Adams, while he was mistaken about the day in which we would celebrate independence from Great Britain, he was certainly right about how we would celebrate it and its internal importance in the history of the Republic. Um, I titled my uh, speech today, I don't know where I'm supposed to point it, <laughs> All right, I titled my speech today, The Unknown History of the Constitution, not because people don't know, or the unknown history about the Declaration of Independence, not because people don't know anything about the Declaration of Independence, but oftentimes what people think they know is often either mistaken or presented in a manner that's not really historically accurate. And there's other facets to the Declaration of the Independence that I think are paramount in importance. Um, the first one is that Thomas Jefferson, in constructing the Declaration of Independence, justifies and affirms the people's natural right to overthrow their government. Uh, whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter and abolish it and institute new government. Um, and he later goes on in that document to say, to take it one step further, to say, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evices a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. So not only is it the people's right, but it is our interposing duty to do this when it becomes necessary, when government becomes too tyrannical. Jefferson affirmed that. Uh, another thing that Jefferson affirmed is government's abilities, um, government's role in our lives. And that largely, according to Jefferson, was to protect our rights. Uh, not to give us stuff, not to provide health care, not to redistribute our wealth, etc. Um, you know, that to protect these rights, governments are instituted among men, driving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That is to suggest that there's no other way that government can 
derive its powers through coercion, through mandate, through assumed and implied powers. None of these things are relevant when it comes to government, only what the people allow government to be. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about the process in which the Declaration of Independence was constructed. Um, in the middle of 1776, Virginia had already written a constitution and declared its own independence from Great Britain. At that point, the, the Virginian legislature told its representatives to the Con Continental Congress, go and declare independence. Make sure people are on board. We're currently really the only free state that is independent. Um, up in Massachusetts, they fought the Battle of Lexington and Concord. They've dissolved their legislature. So Richard Henry Lee introduced the resolution to the Continental Congress. And the Continental Congress should never be looked at as the federal Congress is today. Um, laws were not passed. They re only resolutions were passed. Ultimate sovereignty fell into the hands of the states, which we would not consider states today. They would be considered like countries today. Um, John Adams was forming a committee of five delegates to draft this because while it, independence had not been voted on yet, various uh, representatives have gone back to their home districts and home states to try to either persuade or talk to the people about how they felt about independence. John Adams was the chairman of this committee. Also on the committee was uh, Pennsylvania's Benjamin Franklin, um, New York's Robert Livingston, uh, Virginia's Thomas Jefferson, and Connecticut's Robert Sherman. And John Adams articulates why Jefferson was ultimately chosen to construct the document. The first reason was that he was a Virginian, and Virginia as the most um, strong colony was seen to be a, at the utmost importance. Uh, the second reason was John Adams rightly acknowledged that he was obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. That is his own <laughs> words uh, at the time. And he was. I mean, uh, John Dickinson from Pennsylvania and people like uh, Edward Rutledge from South Carolina definitely thought that. Uh, and Jefferson was very much the contrary. He almost never spoke in the Continental Congress. In fact, people were mystified how he was such an eloquent writer, but almost never chipped in his two cents in proceedings. The third reason is his talents for the pen. Adams had read the Summary of the View of Rights of British America, which Jefferson penned in 1774, which was a response to the Intolerable Acts and the British reaction to Massachusetts. So for these reasons, uh, Jefferson was ultimately chosen. He constructed the document with, within about two weeks, staying in Philadelphia when most of the representatives left to their home states. Now, a lot of things that Jefferson wrote were actually ultimately changed, and he was always bitter about this in some ways. Um, among them, I, I want to just talk uh, about a few, three in particular. Uh, a few are fairly mundane, and that's from the viewpoint of someone that didn't write this document. And that is, uh, the first one, we hold these rights to be sacred, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. That was his first thing that got changed to self-evident. Uh, the second thing, life uh, among the unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property was the original statement written by Jefferson. Now, that is to say that having property, it's not just enough to affirm our natural right to have property, but also the means in which to obtain it, which Jake spoke about. Um, Craig will be speaking later about how individual rights are important and happiness is derived from our uh, taking all of our talents together and doing whatever we would like in a productive capacity. Now the third is the most incendiary and was removed because it was fairly controversial in its time. And it was an indictment, a very strong and incendiary indictment against the British instituted monopoly on the slave trade. This is what Jefferson wrote in the original version and he's referring to George III here. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the obrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep an open keep open a market where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit it or restrain this execrable commerce. And that the assemblage of honors might want no fact of a distinguished die. He is now exciting those very people to rise up in arms against us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them 
by murdering the people upon who he also obtruded them, thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with the crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. So this is a long-winded way of basically saying that uh, through this British-led monopoly on the slave trade, King George III has effectively robbed people of their liberty and only provided it to them when they do his will to deprive others of liberty, in this case the colonies slash states. Now, this is consistent with Jefferson's views on slavery at the time. While Jefferson owned slaves, he definitely viewed slavery as an abomination, but believed that no man really held the ultimate solution to slavery in Virginia and the rest of the United States. Um, that's a subject I'd like to talk about at a different time in, uh, to a larger extent. So I just brought up a picture of part of the Committee of Five that drafted the Constitution. Uh, Thomas Jefferson pre presenting the document to Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. Just an interesting side note that I'd like to say is that Jefferson had the patent for the swivel chair, and he used the swivel chair when writing the Declaration of Independence. It's something that people don't always know. Jefferson had uh, an inventor twist to him, much like Franklin did, and, you know, we all enjoy those in the sanctity of our cubes today in, uh, at work. <laughs> so, I, I love them. I mean, just to, when your boss is out, just to swing around sometimes. <laughs> swing circles, that's a, good, that's a good part. So I just want to talk a little bit about the influences of the Declaration of Independence. Because Jefferson himself said in his letters that there's no new concepts that he wrote about. As eloquent as it was, there's really nothing new about the Declaration of Independence even though it was an incredibly significant document. So I'd like to talk about two of the biggest influences, especially when it comes to the inalienable rights, when he lists life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, originally, remember. That screams of Lockeanism. John Locke, that is almost word for word from one of his treatises. Um, he believed in natural law, that we derive our rights only from God and not from government. Uh, William... William Blackstone is another influence that you don't always hear as much about, but he wrote a famous book called The Commentaries on the Laws of England, which very much influenced the Founding Fathers and really pronounced the idea of parliamentary sovereignty, that people should not be subjects to the crown, that people ultimately should have representative forms of government in a republic. So those were two very important uh, influences. <laughs> Another one is George Mason, sometimes known as the father of the Bill of Rights, along with James Madison. Both of them are called that uh, from time to time. Now, George Mason had already written the Virginia Declaration of Rights uh, earlier, and this was an influential document in constructing the Declaration of Independence. Some of the things, if you read that document today, some of the things are almost lifted directly, but again, almost nothing new. Now, the third influence is one I just want to elaborate on quickly, is the Grand Remonstrance of 1641. And it, it was a list of indictments against the, the King of Britain at the time, Charles Stuart. Now, there's 26 indictments in the Declaration of Independence against George III, and they're extremely reminiscent. I really recommend people read the Grand Remonstrance of 1641 sometimes because it is just eerie what is pointed out in that document. Uh, the British citizens had claims against Charles Stuart on topics ranging from creating sustainable land development uh, regions and extracting the people's wealth to support them, stealing all the bullion in the people's mint and replacing it with what they called an abominable brass money experiment, and levying forced loans as a form of taxation, as if the people wouldn't know what a forced loan is, right? <laughs> so. In this case, uh, Jefferson does almost the same thing, just lists all these different indictments against George III. You know, he has done this, he has done this, for this, for depriving us, in many cases, of trial in, uh, in front of jury, um, for levying taxes without our consent, for dissolving our legislators, etc. I don't have enough time to go into that, but please read that, because it's often overlooked in the Declaration. Um, the last influence that he took was himself. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was instrumental in influencing the Virginia Constitution. Um, when George Mason largely wrote that document, um, but he, Jefferson, while in a time in which he was constructing the Declaration, he was in correspondence with representatives from Virginia to uh, influence it in his own way. So really, Jefferson derived all these different influences in creating the document. Now, I want to speak briefly about the purpose of the Declaration of Independence itself. 
Now, the purpose was to publicize the reasons for which the countries were not only declaring independence from Britain, but independence from uh, the other states. Um, it, was, it was to be read out loud in public gatherings. It was written to include very direct terms so that people would understand them in public realms, so that people could understand exactly and succinctly what Jefferson was saying and what was a national sentiment at the time. Um, it was, it, it was a pronouncement. It was to recite what was already true and apparent. It didn't create any new powers. Jefferson was explaining these things have already existed, and they're, they are true. They are uh, into fruition as we speak. Now, it wasn't to create a national identity, because there really wasn't any. Um, remember, we had sovereign states, and when the Articles of Confederation was ratified in 1781. Article 2 specifically states that the states are to retain their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Well, how can the states do that if they don't already possess sovereignty in the first place? Uh, later in the Constitution, this is continued with the 10th Amendment. All powers that aren't enumerated in the Constitution belong to the states or to the people. That's an important part of it as well. So it was to be read in public gatherings. And one of the ultimate objectives was to eventually provide financial assistance for the, the revolution. Now, by doing this, it, it showed a solidarity-like movement which allowed other nations that were very powerful in the world at that time to acknowledge that you know, there is a solid movement behind independence. It won't, will not just be a single state that, does, that enacts you know, military prowess against the, the British. Um, eventually, we received financial support from the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish. Um, another thing is to attract military sponsorship. Um, the representatives realized that we, our militias, were not in the best modern shape to fight against the greatest empire on God's green earth, on land and in sea. So because of that, they influenced others like Marquis, uh, Marquis Lafayette and Baron von Steuben to come over to the United States, eventually, and train our troops. R meaning the collective troops of all of the sovereign states. Um, it was also to explain that petitions had been tried several times and were either ignored or confronted with hostility by the British and King George III himself. That's noted in the document. There were still those in 1776, and especially in 1775, that still believed that King George III would find a way to end hostilities. Um, uh, people in the United States and in the colonies slash states would not be bound to every British law and would retain some autonomy. That did not take place. So the last part that I want to talk about is the very ending part of the Declaration of Independence. And this is extremely important and almost never covered. So that these united colonies are and right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is not to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, here's the most important part, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all the other acts and things which independent states may of right do. This is a very important declaration because more and more, you know, in studying the Declaration of Independence and what into it, what went into it, you can acknowledge that States were not only being declared as separate and complete, completely dissolved from Great Britain, but also independent from each other. Notice how Jefferson says that they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, and establish commerce. Now, they did actualize those powers, for instance, in Massachusetts and South Carolina and Connecticut. All three of those colonies slash states um, fitted and outfitted, um, outfitted, sorry, outfitted and armed warships and deployed them against the British. Um, Connecticut militia took uh, control of Fort Ticonderoga. Um, the executive in New Hampshire, the governor in New Hampshire at the time, had the ability to uh, make orders of mark and reprisal against the British. So all of, and there's many other examples obviously, but all of the states recognized their sovereignty at that time. This is very important because it shows that the sovereignty of the states predates that of the Constitution. The last thing that I really want to mention today, and this is extremely important, is sometimes I hear the question, well, is the Declaration of Independence a founding document? And oftentimes it might seem like an obvious answer that the answer is yes. But more and more as I study this area, I think the answer is actually no. 
The Declaration of Independence actually only affirmed what was already true at the time and just recognized the sovereignty of the states. It did not find, uh, found a new government. So that's one thing that I wanted to talk about today. Um, I would love to stay and chat with some of you later if you have any interest in history or want to discuss these things. I also have a, tr a Twitter handle called Crush It Son. It's basically my mentality toward tyranny. And uh, I'd love to speak with any of you later. So with that, I will pass the remainder of my time. So thank you very much. What? All they have to do is buy you a beer, right? And you'll talk even longer. Come on up here, Jack. Let's tell these good people about the Tea Party Pack. All right, we started the Tea Party Pack uh, Political Action Committee a couple months ago, and we wanted to expand the Tea Party footprint in the state of Minnesota, and we're having some success, aren't we, Jack? We're having a great time. And it's expanding. The South Metro Tea Party, wow, what a, what a kickoff, 150 plus people. Um, something they didn't tell you, we even had a DFL tracker in the crowd, that we, which is kind of cool. I pointed them out to everybody and invited them to stay and be part of us, and they kind of faded away, so. But uh, also, the East Metro, Jake, you've done wonderful. This thing, give Jake a great hand, and other players. Dave is the other organizer here at the East Metro. Right. See, we started out with the East Metro Tea Party. Actually, the, this organization started with the North Metro Tea Party as a concept. We expanded here to Lake Elmo with the East Metro Tea Party in April. We just topped out with the South Metro Tea Party. In fact, I don't even know if they need our help anymore. They're awesome. <laughs> and uh, we already have two leads going on in the Southeast Metro, the Hastings, Cottage Grove area. And we have a couple of people that want to step up to Plate and Plymouth. So we're expanding this Tea Party, and we do that through the Tea Party Toolkit. And all we did is we asked for small donations, and I'll pass around this jar again. This actually helps quite a bit in our funding, because we did raise $8,000 needed to buy the podium and the speakers and the flags and the projector, but it costs money to move that, uh, that two Tea Party Toolkit, the gasoline that goes into it, the maintenance, the insurance, and all that stuff. Plus, we also have two iPads over there. We're being smart using technology in the uh, Tea Party pack. We, Jake, hang out one second. Oh, sure. If you haven't registered, please go over and check this out. You put your name, your first name, your last name, and your email, and you're on board. We don't have to take a piece of paper, interpret your handwriting, and then put it in there wrong and have you come back and say, you guys didn't like me, you didn't send me anything. You put it in, and you help us, okay? So it makes it great. Uh, those two, go to each like over to South Metro. And it made it very easy. But we do, for people like Jake that do resist putting their names in something, we have pen and paper. <laughs> I was going to say, Jake, you took my job away. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a reason for that, Karen. No, it's good. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we'll pass around this jar here. Please, if you could put a couple bucks in, it's amazing how that adds up in the end. It'd help out with the Tea Party expand its footprint. And uh, Jack, we're not gonna go into this, we really should say this, but right now we're thinking about going to the State Fair with the Tea Party. Now why are you telling all the secrets? You can't tell secrets. I'll tell you, I work with him, I work with him and he blows his secrets all the time. It's terrible. But another thing, the little podium right there, that's its debut. That is our traveling uh, podium and for smaller rooms it contains its own sound system all right so the the uh, actual trailer is becoming it I mean we have the trailer but we have to build the inside of it to hold this stuff so uh, carpentry wise we got to build a little stage in case we have something outside Jack, yes do you think Sarah Palin would look good behind this will you knock it off oh, I'm, 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 I'm gonna okay. leave him home all right that's terrible Anyhow, the Tea Party Pack, you can check us out, www.teaparty.mn, help expand the footprint. If you know anyone that wants to lead a new Tea Party or trying to expand, we want to basically cover the state of Minnesota, every BPOU, every Senate district, we want to expand it because we want to influence politics and bring this, this government back to its constitutional limits. Okay, now for the fun part of the evening. I'm, I'm just going to stop. Okay, why don't you, you get to introduce a great, great sponsor. 
All right. What's for the people that are new here? What's also unique about the East Metro Tea Party is we like to have a fun political entertainment hour where we play a game, kind of light up the mood, check on education, you know that kind of thing. And we always ask for sponsors to give us prizes. So, without further ado, making its second appearance at the East Metro Tea Party, it's already had an appearance at the South Metro Tea Party. I bring to you who wants to be a millionaire. Woo! Before taxes. So, the rules of the game. I'm going to bring up three people and they're going to get a question. They have to try to guess it. And the person that raises first and answers correctly will be our contestant. The other two walk away with a caribou gift card. I mean, you can't complain with that. That person that guesses it right gets that caribou, one, one of those $5 gift cards to caribou. And they have to, uh, they have one minute to answer each question. We, if you've watched the game, anyone watch that game? Who wants to be a millionaire? It has a couple echelons as you move up in dollar amounts. Well, after three questions, you protect your car. And you can get to the final top tier, which is a million dollar tier, and you can win, get this, a free lunch. A $10 gift card to Subway. With total grand prize of two $5 Careful gift cards and a ten dollar gift card to Subway. You have three methods of assistance throughout the game. Once you use it, you're done. You don't get it back. You can have me take two of the possible answers off, 50-50. You can call a friend. That's anyone, and they're going to go live. We're going to use a speaker, and you can ask the audience to see if they've been paying attention. So, without further ado, here are the echelons. We start with $1,000, that's the easy one, all right? You got your $5 gift card, you have it protected once you answer number three successfully, then I'm gonna hand you another $5 caribou gift card, and at any point you can walk away and say I quit. The audience will hate you for that, by the way. But you can quit and keep your two gift cards at that point. But as you move up, you don't, you don't keep that gift card, that's not safe until you answer number six right, and then I hand you that subway free lunch. Our sponsor today for our gift cards is for Perspective. I heard the owner is a true patriot. I also heard he likes to wear headbands. He sweats a lot. Brand management, marketing, and advertising. If you need some better answers, get some for Perspective. <laughs> All right, what I need is three people. Raise your hand. I'm going to look at the first hand that goes up. Linda, Nate, in the back, you come on up here. Yay. Say your name and where are you from? Linda Stanton, I'm from Woodbury. Nate Zanker from Woodbury. Joshua Pillow from Marion St. Croix. Alrighty. Everyone give him a round of applause here. You all understand how the game works, right? You're going to see this first question up there. You're going to have four options. I'm going to watch. The audience will keep me honest. The first person to raise their hand and get this question right is our contestant. If you lose this round, I'll give you a $5 gift card to carry what the heck. You walk back and you got $5 to carry, but you can't complain with that, right? They do have fruity drinks too. First question. Which of these individuals is not a formal candidate for the 2014 Minnesota, Minnesota gubernatorial election? That's the governor's election. <laughs> Scott Honor. Is it B, Dave Thompson? Is it C, Stuart Mills? Or is it D, Jeff Johnson? Linda. Stuart Mills. Stuart Mills? Stuart Mills is correct. Good job. Linda is our contestant. Now, Linda, tell, tell these people, Stuart Mills, who is he? What is he doing? What's he running for? I think he's running against, um, oh boy, uh, the guy that beat, oh, that uh, let me trip, chip Krivak. <laughs> um, no, 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 Congressional District Day, good job. That you don't win a prize for that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go, Linda. This is your gift card right now. You could quit right now. The audience will hate you for that. You can quit right now. <laughs> Walk away with five dollars to caribou. All right, I'm gonna give you the microphone actually because we got two here. Give you my card. Don't worry about it. Okay. Are you ready for the next question? I don't know. I'll tell there's numbers up there. Stand right over here. Okay. Next question. What is the Minnesota state bird? Is it A, 
a robin, B, a common loon, C, an ostrich, or D, mosquito? <laughs> two, I will accept two of these as a potential answer. It's a common loon. B, common loon, is that your final answer? That is correct. All right. I thought Clark Bacon's name was going to be up there. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. That makes us a lunatic state. That's right. Now that was a thousand dollars. That's the easy one. It gets much harder. I hope you were paying attention to Dave. Okay, sixty-four thousand dollar question. You ready, Linda? Audience, are you ready? Here we go. What was the primary purpose of government according to Jefferson? Was it A, protect rights, B, establish the National Bank, C, regulate interstate commerce, or D, provide general welfare? A. Hey, audience. We didn't ask you. Wow. Do I have to take them all up for coffee? <laughs> yes, you do. What was your answer, Linda? A. A, protect rights, is correct. She is moving on. All right, Linda. You, it's tough, isn't it, right? At this session, 125000 you can actually keep that card. It's safe. And i give you another one. So, if you get this right, are you ready for it? Yeah. You want to move on, right? Okay. 125, let's see that question. Which is not a tenant of the free enterprise system? Is it A, competition? B, private property? C, centralized banking? <laughs> D, voluntary exchange? Centralized banking. Are you sure about that? I'm positive. Are you saying that the Federal Reserve is not part of the free enterprise system? <laughs> Probably not. The Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, not part of free enterprise. Nah. Well, you are right. You are safe with that gift card. These are too easy, aren't they? Not for long. <laughs> we don't just hand out free lunches that easy. All right, here's your next gift card. Anytime you can quit, but that's not safe until you answer the sixth question or million dollar question. Are you ready, Linda? You want to continue? Okay. Who was the principal author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights? Was it A, Thomas Jefferson, B, Samuel Adams, D, or C, Patrick Henry, or D, George Mason? George Mason. You're pretty quick on that one. I was waiting for the audience. I don't think they knew it. I think, I think only one other person in this room knew that. So you're sure. Well, my niece went to George Mason, but... I didn't learn that from her. I learned that from that guy. That guy over there, he's a good teacher, isn't he? Well, you are correct. He is the correct answer. I'm getting a little nervous, Jack. We might, uh, we might be handing out the big prize tonight. All right, you want to continue on? The $250,000 question. Well, I know you want to recycle these gift cards. <laughs> I don't care. It's not me sponsoring this one, so. Win them all. <laughs> all right, $500,000. Let's see what the question is. Which of the following founding fathers was not on the Committee of Five which drafted, drafted the Declaration of Independence? Is it A, Benjamin Franklin, B, John Hancock, C, Robert Livingston, or D, Roger Sherman? What, what did you just say? That's a hard one. All right, it gets harder. Remember, you have three lifelines right now. You could ask the audience, you could call a friend, or you could have me eliminate two of the possible answers. I love that when these tricky ones, the audience gets real quiet. Like, Man, did I write that one down? Ask, ask the audience. You want to ask the Are you sure? They're really quiet out there. <laughs> I don't know about that, Linda. All right, Linda's going to ask the audience. So, audience, which of the following founding fathers was not on the Committee of Five which drafted the Declaration of Independence? Was it A, Benjamin Franklin, B, John Hancock, C, Robert Livingston, or D, Roger Sherman? The answer is... B. They're all over the place. You're going to make fun of the audience, you got to put it on the microphone. Is <laughs> so they were all over the place? <laughs> I'll say John Hancock. Sure about that. There's a couple 
of influencers in here. I didn't see Ben or Clavin. Final answer? Yeah, that's my final answer. B is correct. <laughs> All right, Linda, it's never happened before at the East Metro Tea Party. No one's ever won the million dollar question. They did at the South Metro. They did. I guess they're a little smarter down there, aren't they? The final question, the million dollar question for Spectrum couldn't field you that million dollars, so they're going to give you a ten dollar gift card to the subway instead. <laughs> According to the Heritage Foundation's 2013 Index of Economic Freedom, which country is rated number one in economic freedom? Is it A, this wasn't covered today, A, New Zealand, B, Hong Kong, C, Singapore, or D, Switzerland? Shh. Economic freedom, and you have two <laughs> lifelines left. She didn't ask for audience participation. <laughs> I'm just. I'm gonna go with New Zealand. No life What? I I I hear. I need to hear a final answer. When you say final answer, I have to take your answer. <laughs> uh, you can't just do this, Linda. I'm not going to take that. I just told you the rules. You don't have to ask for help. If you're confident in your answer, you just tell me the answer. I'm going to go with A. Yeah, New Zealand. A, final answer? Yeah? yeah Can yeah. you say it? Say it. Say final answer. She's, she's just not so certain about that. Her final answer is New Zealand. Audience, what do you think it is? C, D, C. Oh wow. It is actually Hong Kong. The answer is B Hong Kong. Can you believe that? Where's the United States on that? <laughs> you can keep the second gift card, but you did not win the free lunch, Linda. Thank you so much for hosting. Thank you very much. Uh, the those those four answers were all top five. Uh, the number one was Hong Kong. Number two was Singapore. Singapore's actually moving up, so I would imagine that surpasses it. And uh, then I believe uh, New Zealand and, and then uh, Switzerland was number five. Canada, number six. United States, number ten. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Linda, for participating. That's fun, isn't it? Yeah. A good time. Man. Now, you know, our, our sponsors, we haven't found that one that's willing to dish out the million dollars. In fact, they probably want to pick some of the questions if they were going to put that online. But if our sponsors could afford the million dollars, she wouldn't walk away with that million dollars. First of all, the federal income, or federal government would say, we're going to tax that $343,000. And then thank you, DFL legislature and Governor Dayton, raising the top marginal rate to 9.8%. Now you pay $91,000 and taxes on that a million dollars. So really, Linda, if she would have got that last one right, she would have came home with uh, $564,585. Probably couldn't have bought a lunch at Subway with that. <laughs> All right, it is my distinct honor to bring one of the patriots here that's been at every East Metro Tea Party. In fact, that actually makes him a founding father of the East Metro Tea Party. He is retired 3M. He is known as a sign guy, which uh, you're going to see in a couple slides. Without further ado, speaking on the celebration of individual rights, Craig Shorts. Well, thank you. Let me tell you a little story about why I am Craig the sign guy, and I'll show you some signs here in a minute. So the day Obamacare was passed, we watched, is the mic on? Yeah. And here. Hey, Craig, this is a wonderful, uh, what do we have? 
Hold it close up. Hold it close up. Can you put it like about six foot one? <laughs> How's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the day uh, Obamacare was, was debated, my wife Janice over here in the red, and we watched C-SPAN for like 13 hours. And the more I watched, the more angry I got. And Janice says, well, stop screaming at the TV, smart guy. What are you going to do about it? And I told her, I am going to make the biggest damn sign that I can make and put it, and we live between Newport and Woodbury on Glen Road, and I'm going to put it on our garden fence on Glen Road. So uh, the final two hours of debate on C-SPAN, I made a, made a sign that was four foot by 10 foot tall. <laughs> and at the top, it said fascism. And most people don't understand the definition of fascism, but what fascism really is, is government control private property. And, and the rest of the sign was about the United States now controls 50% of the economy. I think uh, health care added something like 12 or 13%. Yeah. So with the banks, uh, with student loans, with uh, you know, automotive companies, it was estimated to be 50% of the economy. And in the bottom it said, vote them out. So what I found out about a week later is that Woodbury has a sign ordinance. <laughs> And I got a letter from the, from the city of Woodbury that says the sign ordinance is six square feet and only one sign. So my wife Janice says, well, what are you going to do now, smart guy? <laughs> and I was still angry, and I says, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to put up a new sign every week until he's voted out of office. And depending <laughs> who is voted in, Depending who is voted in, I may continue for another four years. <laughs> so just as an example of, of one of the signs I made, it was this. <laughs> so let me just tape this up here for inspiration. So as we were waiting for the bus on Monday morning after I put it up on Sunday, my granddaughter, granddaughters, I think at that time they were about seven and eight, they said, Grandpa, what does WTF stand for? I said, it's where's the freedom? That's what it said. So here's, uh, here's some examples, um, and they're, they're kind of a, a mix of, of facts, of uh, quotes from the founding fathers, of current events, with a really good dose of humor sent in, put in there. Um, this is one that went viral all over, up and down the East Coast, um, up when the, the big debate was about, you know, those evil oil companies. This is about our deficit principles and our debt principles and our $100 trillion of unfunded liability. The inspiration came from Wimpy. I'd gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. It, it really isn't much different than the way we run our fiscal budgets. This is about our principle of taxation. It's just tax them enough so they don't die. <laughs> this is my, my favorite. One of my favorites. The <laughs> treasury is just like two drunks leaning on each other so they don't fall down. A taxpayer vote for Obama is like chicken voting for Colonel Sanders. <laughs> And this, I truly believe, is America is the last best hope of man on earth. Amen. Amen. And if America goes all of Western civilization. <laughs> and I think about two or maybe three Fourth of July's ago, I put this, celebrate the birth of individual rights and this great nation. And that's what my, my speech about is tonight. 
it's about um, the principle of America and the importance of individual rights. So uh, Dave mentioned that on this day, 237 years ago, Continental Congress voted unanimously that we would be independent. And a country, the first country ever, based on an idea was formed. You know, all previous countries were based on, you know, some kind of geographic principle or allegiance to a king or to a <coughs> culture. The first country ever born was born based on an idea. And that founding principle is man has rights, that your life belongs to you. That is the founding principle of the United States of America. Oh, um, before I go further, I do have a, uh, one of the things on the signs that I didn't mention is I have a, a signed email list that goes out to about, I think about 500 people direct, and it's forward all over the place. Um, sometimes I get a forward from a forward from a forward, forward that says, Craig, did you see this guy? I says, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, so I don't know, I think, you know, with all the forwards and posts and stuff, it probably goes to 5,000 people. Uh, and, and Bev has dramatically increased the circulation of this. She just sent it to all the Minnesota senators and all the Minnesota representatives. <laughs> If you'd like to be on the list, um, you only get one email, uh, and the email kind of has about a three or four paragraph description of what it's all about. So let me pass this around. There's, uh, uh, I think, about 20 other signs that, uh, that you can take a look at here, too. So, you know, I said that we were a country uh, based on ideas, and people came from all over. You know, we had the English Quakers, we had the English Puritans, we had the regular old English and the Dutch, and, the, and in this area we had the Finns and the Norwegians and the Swedes that, that all came to America. And they came to escape tyranny in one form or another, and to seek freedom and to seek their fortunes and to seek happiness. And that was really the principle of, of forming the United States. And this idea of your life belonging to you, it was an idea that man has rights and that these rights are inalienable and that they cannot be taken away. Um, most fundamental is that a man owns his life, not a king, not a country, not a neighbor, not mob rule by majority, by, by democracy, but that your life belongs to you. And that was the founding principle of the United States that is embodied in the Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution. And that's what we're cel celebrating in two days. So what are rights? To our founding fathers, it was the right to life, to liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I learned something today from Dave. I didn't know that Jefferson invented the, the swivel chair and that he originally had the right to private property as one of our rights. And that's, that's really fundamental. Um, and the key about what rights are is right is, is a right to action. And it's the freedom to act in your own self-interest. Rights are pre-political. And I don't know if anybody watches uh, Judge Napolitano on, on Fox News. Yeah. And that really struck me. He was talking about gun rights. He says gun rights don't come from government. Gun, gun rights come from the nature of man. It's pre-political. They come from the right to defend yourself and to defend your family. And that's really key, is that rights don't come from government. They come from the nature of, of us as being human beings. You don't have to ask for permission to exercise them, you know, which, which seems very strange now. And, uh, you know, we had Jake had 
<coughs> had examples of all the permission you have to have to have just to add a, a group from. Um, they're your natural rights, and and it's the link between what it means to be moral and the laws of society. So. I don't know if, if there's any chemists in the audience. Is there any people that took chemistry? Because I'm going to make a really, really strange analogy. Individual rights are like soap. So anybody that took, took chemistry, soap is like a coupling agent. It's got this M that's like water, and it's got this M that has, that's oil, oil base, and it, it will emulsify this thing. Individual rights is this interface between ethics and politics. It's what connects the two. It co connects morality and law. Uh, and a good dose of individual right is what we need to really clean up politics, I think. <laughs> so the fundamental is your life belongs to you. Everything else is deri derivative, um, such as you know, all that's listed here. Um, Self-defense, freedom of speech, freedom to produce, freedom to trade. All are natural rights and all are pre-political. So for instance, property rights are the implementation of your right to life. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. And that's why I found it so fascinating what Jefferson was pushing for, is you have a right to property. The right to property is the right to action. So it's the right to go out to produce, to produce whatever you want, to price it however you want, to promote it however you want. It's not the right to the goods, <clears throat> but it's the freedom to produce goods. And if you produce it, you own it. You earned it. And nobody in government can tell you otherwise. That is the principle of government. tell you a little story there. Um, so there was a, a debate at the University of Minnesota sponsored by the Ayn Rand group. And a lot of what I'm, I'm drawing from is Ayn Rand's theory of individual rights. But uh, in this debate was Jaron Brock, who is the, the president of the Ayn Rand Institute of Individual Rights, and a guy by the name of Dane Smith, who's the president of Growth and Justice. So it's like a social justice uh, of them. And the debate went on for like an hour. And at the end, Yaron Brock had Dave Smith babbling, and he finally acknowledged that your life does not belong to you, it belongs to the government. And that was captured on YouTube. That's where he went. And that's the fundamental in any of these debates. Does your life belong to you, or does it belong to the government? And he acknowledged that, well, of, of course, if we're going to do taxation, well, then maybe taxation is labor. Maybe then your life really doesn't belong to you. So to secure these rights, and this is why we have government, is to secure these rights, the only thing that you have to agree to is to not initiate force against others. And that's it, as they have the same rights as you do. So in order to secure these rights, we form the government. And with the sole purpose of protecting our individual rights. And for the first time in history, government didn't rule individuals, but individuals ruled the government. And that is the principle of the United States. Supposedly, that is the supposed principle. So we veered very, very far. The proper function of government, and I think Dave kind of had this when he talked about free markets and that circle that he had around free markets, and this is, is very similar. The purpose of government was to protect us from foreign invaders, which is the proper function of government, is our military, to protect us from criminals, which is our police force, and to protect us from fraud and contracts, which is our court system. That, in essence, is the proper function of government, those three things. So we gave our government 
the exclusive use of force and it's the exclusive use of force to use force against force. That is the principle of the government. And to protect us from the government, we established the Bill of Rights and our Constitution. That's what protects us from government. And we became a constitutional republic. So I don't know if you've had discussions with people that graduate from college and you ask them, well, what kind of, what kind of government do we have in the United States? And they will respond, well, we have a, a democracy. No. And, that, and, and I tell you, I, I bet you, in my experience, I think only maybe 30% know that we have a constitutional republic. We do not have a democracy. We have democratic processes, but we do not have a democracy. Democracy is mob rule. And that is why Greece fell, because of mob rule. That's exactly what the Democratic Party stands for. Yeah. So Franklin, I think this was attributed to Franklin. There's some debate. He says democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for dinner. That's what <laughs> democracy is. And the lamb has no individual rights. <laughs> And I think we're all being served as dinner now. <laughs> so to understand what individual rights are, let me contrast them with what they aren't. So the, the one thing that they're not, um, or it's, there is never ever a conflict of true individual rights. So each of us hold equivalent rights and if an alleged right of one man necessitates the violation of another man, there is no way that it can be a right. It, rights never conflict. They never violate one another. So for instance, food stamps puts an obligation on another individual to pay for it. Food stamps cannot be a right. So, um, and I kind of call these uh, these five things, the, the five bags of crap. So let me go on to uh, bag number, number two. So bag number two is positive rights. So President Obama commented that the main problem with the Constitution is that it's a charter of negative liberties. And what that means is it specifies what a government cannot do to the people. Obama wants a charter of positive liberties, asserting what the government can do for people, or more appropriately, what the government can do to people. Under the Constitution, there is no such thing as positive rights. And I think there's a, there's a group in Harvard working on rewriting the Constitution. I think it's called Constitution 2021. And it's all about rewriting positive rights into our Constitution. So related to this is economic rights. So when this started with FDR, and FDR started this idea of economic rights, and it was made explicit in the 1960 Democratic Convention. And this is what, they, what was claimed as rights the right to a job, a fair wage, a decent home, medical care, protection from economic fear of old age, sickness, accident, or unemployment, and a good education. None of these things are rights. And if you look at the platform of the 1960 Democratic Convention, it's the same damn platform as it is now. And, and this was the biggest gimmick to erode individual rights, is to switch rights from the idea of political rights to economic rights. So economic rights imposes, somebody's gotta pay for it, it imposes taxation on everybody else. Economic rights are not rights. And it leads to this slippery slope of redistributing income, and this concept of fair share and pay your fair share. Even if it's fraud. <clears throat> Absolutely. 
So the third, or the fourth bag of crap here, is collective rights. So groups do not have rights. So you hear, for example, union rights, corporate rights, women rights, gay rights. There is no such thing as group rights. The only individuals have rights. So a man does not acquire new rights or does not lose rights by, by joining a group. Group rights are only the rights of individuals working together. And that's what a corporation is. Everybody in the corporation, employees and, sh and shareholders, <coughs> they all have rights, but it's all based on their individual rights. The last area is the claim of the common good. This is like the catch-all, common good or public interest. These are meaningless concepts, and they're used kind of as a moral blank check. Goods, values, and interests only have relevance to individuals. At the root of the term common good, it's the good of the majority at the expense of the minority. At, at sacrificing individual rights. So it's a violation of the individual rights and it's anti-American, and you hear it all the time. And both parties accept it. Oh, we gotta do this for the common good or for the public good. So we need to fight against all of these, all of these concepts. So individual rights are being violated all over. And when individual rights are violated or repealed, there's no way to determine the justice of anyone's claim. And what it reverts to is the tribal concept of one's wishes are limited by the power of the gang. So we have a lot of gangs. It becomes tribal warfare between the Democratic gang and the Republican gang and the Union gang, the welfare gang, the crony capitalist gang, the, the the two drunks leaning on themselves, the Federal Reserve and the, and the Treasury, it ends up in tribal warfare with no basis of individual rights and no basis to sort it out. Ayn Rand said this nearly 50 years ago. And, and if anybody read the book Atlas Shrugged, you can, it's almost like it was written today. If you just change the name of the characters, insert Barney Frank in there somewhere, and all the other characters, and, and Bernanke, and uh, the story all flows, and it all came true. And what was so unique about her, she was raised in Russia, and she saw the Russian Revolution unfold from her window, from the square. And she was about 10 or 11 years old, and came into the United States. And she, she saw this slippery slope. What she said 50 years ago, we are headed to a civil war of pressure groups looting and devouring one another. And that's where we are today. That was a shrug enough. Absolutely. What's the name of the book? Uh, it's called Atlas Shrug. Atlas Shrug. Yep. So the big question is, what, what do we do? And, you know, to straighten this out, it depends on actions of individuals. And we all have to fight like never before. And we have to educate ourselves about individual rights, about the constitutions, about the principles of our founding fathers. And we need to influence others. And we have to stop being Minnesota nice, and we need to get into arguments. We need to pronounce moral judgment. If we don't agree with it, state your judgment. And even if you're not equipped to argue it, walk away. But don't let it go <coughs> unsaid. We all, all have to fight. And we all have to remember that our lives belong to us. And it's up to each of us to live our own life as, as moral and as glorious as, as we can. So that's the meaning of the celebration coming up in two days. Um, feel free to celebrate however you want. For me, it will be lighting off fireworks and maybe having a few beers. <laughs> but what I want to leave you with is uh, a quote 
from Ayn Rand, um, and it, it's a parting thought about the 4th of July. And uh, this comes from, it's in Ayn Rand's uh, letter, uh, Nation of Unity. And she says, quote, it is in this context, from the perspective of the bloody millennia of mankind's history. So she's talking about the thousand years before 1776 and all the blood that was let and the wars from kings and dictators. So she says, in this context, from the perspective of the bloody millennia of mankind, that I want you to look at the birth of a miracle, the United States of America. If it were ever proper for men to kneel, we should kneel when we read the Declaration of Independence. The concept of individual rights is so prestigious a feat of political thinking that few men fully grasp it. And 200 years have not been enough for other countries to understand it. But this is the concept to which we owe our lives, the concept which made it possible for us to bring into reality everything of value that any of us did or will achieve or experience. It is a really great celebration coming up. I think it's the best of America holidays. And uh, please have fun, try to influence some people, and, uh, and think about individual rights and our founding fathers. So thank you very much. I forgot, two more signs. <laughs> This, uh, uh, this actually wasn't my original. This uh, came from Jörn Brock, the uh, president of the Ayn Rand Institute. Patrick Henry did not say, roll back government a bit or give me debt. He did not say, I would like the Ryan budget plan because that will solve everything. And Jefferson said, one man with courage is a majority. Amen. Yeah. Do you still have some signs in your yard? And what are you doing with your ones that you already had? You well, know, I can sell them to people. I have this one right here. Right now. I have this one right here. So I actually have 168 signs that are in Janice's closet. I I have them all, and uh, every week I come up with a new one, and there's an email that goes out to uh, about you know 500. And where do you live in Woodbury? Uh, we live on Glen Road, so come out of uh, Newport off Highway 61 on Glen Road. You can't miss them. Yeah, you got a flag flying there too? Yes, there is. A tea Party flag, yes. And, uh, and Janice has a, about a six or seven foot fence that we made to keep the deer up, but we also store giraffes there once in a while, so you won't miss them. <laughs> on Woodbury's ordinance on for signs, you said six square feet? Is yeah, so it's two foot by three foot. Does that apply to political signs? Um, yeah, I asked that, and they said, well, that's different. That's, that's political different. signs. Well, these are political signs. No, they're not. These are opinion signs. Yeah. Well, we had that discussion. Okay. He also came out, and I wasn't there. Janice was down by the garden. And uh, he takes his tape measure, and he measures the sign about how tall it was. And he says, uh, your sign is three inches too tall. <laughs> and Janice said, well, I'll just kick three inches of dirt underneath this and it'll be just right. <laughs> um, we had a, a, I don't even know who did this. They started putting other signs on our fence and they're all positive, you know, like throw the bums out and things like that. I just left them up. Woodbury sent me a note saying, if you don't take those signs down, you will be fined a hundred dollars a day. Oh. was my fine. So I eventually did take those signs down. <laughs> Ask the words of delegation of authority to deprive me of my rights, my First Amendment right. Use that and it kill me. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I'll be at the bar afterwards if you want. <laughs> <laughs>
Craig, Craig, you stole my, uh, stole my slides. I stole your slides. Here. <laughs> well, you don't need them. Um, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned that about Woodbury. I, I once, did you guys know you can't water your lawn like yeah. from noon to five and you have uh, either every odd day or every even day? Yeah. I do it every day. Yeah, $25 <laughs> later I found that out. <laughs> okay, if you've never been... Can you, can you go back again? What slide? Oh yeah, you want to see Craig's email and just send you an email if you want to get on the distro, I'm guessing that's probably the most appropriate way. Otherwise, go buy Craig a beer afterwards and uh, share more of his thoughts. <coughs> Okay, if you've never been to East Metro Tea Party, another thing that's unique about what we do is we like to show what's trending on YouTube, but since tonight we have a theme, I've selected a couple uh, uh, select videos that focus on independence and economic and individual rights. Uh, so, here is our list tonight. The first one is how I like to <laughs> express my rights in fish. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are heading up north and going to a cabin. Oh, you didn't, you didn't authorize this, Dave? <laughs> the second one is something that came across my desk the other day. It's about a two minute video, a guy explaining his right to defend himself, as Craig talked about with the Second Amendment. Video three, if you remember me talking about how profits are bad, Peter Schiff, an economic uh, expert, uh, financial guru, went to the Democratic National Con convention last fall and asked if profit should be banned. It's a very interesting five minute video. And then I figured let's end the conversation with Milton Freeman. Uh, if some of you are probably old enough to remember his uh, segment called Free to Choose. They're all available on YouTube nowadays and he explains uh, the free enterprise system pretty well. So let's get started here. I think the total videos probably last about 15 minutes. Aaron Weiss, and I live in the town of Poughkeepsie. I'm a combat veteran of Iraq, and I'm also a law enforcement officer. I attended the Public Safety Committee's last meeting in regards to its resolution, but I didn't say anything because I wanted to hear what everyone else had to say. And I heard some shocking things from some people and some legislators. They said that it took a lot of courage to pass this SAFE Act. Apparently, my definition of courage differs from yours. You see, if it was really so courageous to bill and it took so much courage to pass it, then why was it done in the middle of the night when no one could see it or read it? That's not courage. That's a mafia-style sit-down to divvy up what's good for the bosses. Courage is taking the right and true course of action, not the politically expedient one. And anyone who is proud of this law must also be proud of the Patriot Act, the TSA, imprisoning Japanese citizens in World War II, since all these actions were spurred on by emotional fear and rammed through in the name of public safety. Another issue is the insistence of certain people to stand on the graves of dead children and challenge those that disagree to say to the parents' faces, well, I for one will pick up that gauntlet. First off, why is dead children your battle cry? You didn't say anything about the hundreds of Chicago children being killed, and for some reason you only scream when it happens to wealthy white ones. And yes, I will say to anyone's face, my right is more important than your dead because I fought for it firsthand. I washed the blood of my friends out of, out of my home bay and I picked up their mangled bodies, and I fought day in and day out. I did more things that people can't imagine. So yeah, my right trumps your dead. I earned it in blood. I gave up a lot for this country, including my youth, and better men than me gave up a whole lot more, so that all of you, myself included, could enjoy the rights that are guaranteed to us in our Constitution and Bill of Rights. And we didn't go through all that to come back home and watch the surrender of what we fought for happen based on the demented actions of a couple madmen. So in closing, 
I would like to address specifically the legislators we all know who are going to vote against this resolution. I understand you will vote against this resolution based on some misguided sense of the public good. However, as a law enforcement officer, I'm curious to know about your true resolve. Since voting to take away someone's rights is totally different than being asked to enforce it, I want you to consider this. If you support the SAFE Act so wholeheartedly, are you willing to stand with law enforcement members elite from the front to enforcement? And what I mean by that is if a constituent of yours feels so alienated by this law and the manner in which it was passed that they refuse to comply with it, are you willing to stack up on their front door and go in first? I bet if a clause was in this bill that required you, the elected leadership, our elected leaders, to go in the door first, I bet you would not be so steadfast. I am here in North Carolina at the site of the Democratic National Convention. Not that many people here now. I don't know, maybe they're all out looking for work. Actually, wait a minute. This is the Democratic Convention. They don't want to work. You think it's fair that corporations make all these profits? Uh, no, I don't think it's fair that they make that many profits. That's right. we got to ban profits. We need corporate profits. Maybe we should have corporate losses. <laughs> well, I don't want to go that far. You actually want to force corporations to lose money? Yeah, I think so. One issue is corporations have profits, and I want to ban those profits so that the workers can have higher wages and that the consumers can get lower prices. That is obviously something I would be in favor of. Would, would you be in favor of a law that banned corporate profits? Corporate profits? Profits, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. What do you think happens with corporate profits? Um, they keep it and they get bigger and bigger. I know, and they squeeze the people, they exploit their customers, they gouge them with high prices. Let's, yeah, let's take away those profits. Exactly. Can they just fire people to make a bigger profit? Absolutely not. Okay, so you want to control who they can hire. Regulated. I'm a part of a labor union. Would you support <laughs> President Obama if he came out in favor of a law to ban corporate profits? Yes. If you're talking just pure profit? Yeah, the stuff that's left over for the greedy capitalists. I I could actually support that. What about putting a cap on corporate profits? I think so. I think a cap is the way to go. That's it's some, something that we looked at with a lot of our corporate giveaways in Louisiana. We couldn't get folks to come to the table to, to outright uh, repeal some of those things, but we were able to get them to, to cap them. I would be in favor of uh, federal law to limit corporate profits. So limit them. So have a cap on how much profit yeah. they can make? Yeah. I don't think one person should be able to make like a hundred million dollars in one year. They just keep all that money. I tend to agree with you. So there should be a limit to how much some corporations can Listen, make. absolutely. And individual CEO caps as well. How, how, just caps in general. Caps in general. How about a cap on profits? We just basically I, say... I could agree with that. Would you be in favor of a law banning corporate profits? Of course. My concern is education of, uh, of children and families and working women and single parents. Oh, absolutely, me too, but would you be willing to pay for that by by banning corporate profits? Uh, I, I'm not gonna make an opinion on that because I don't know enough about it. Well, what if Obama wanted to do it? Would you support him? Uh, I will support anything my president wants to do. Anything? <laughs> Anything. Okay, question. Okay. Okay. Would you support a new federal law to ban corporate profits? They will not lose their health insurance. Give me a second to think about that. I would like to put a cap on it. So a cap, meaning that there's a certain amount of money Absolutely. and they can't make more than that. As so we put a cap on corporate profits so that no one corporation can earn too much money. Now, I think that's a good idea. I want to get the Democrats to put in their platform an official ban on corporate profits. What, would, would you be behind that? <laughs> well, I'm not a member of the platform of, of the platform committee, so I think the, the fortunately the time has passed for your for your input to be put in the platform committee in order to get to be. But, sure but, but would you be in favor of something like that? Well, it's something I'd have to consider. Look, their fair share is a lot, right? A lot. They can afford it, absolutely. They can afford it. Let's make them pay. 
Let's do it. Through the nose, yeah. Through the nose. I'm here. Yes, Obama. Obama, exactly. We need to just take the money because the people need that money. The people need that money? Yeah, we need, sure. we need health care, we need education, oh, yeah. we need good jobs. Yeah, rich could... people don't need any money, they're rich. Yeah. Those corporations want their profits. They want, But, I mean, we need the money, the people. We deserve that money. I mean, we do the hard work. We do all the shopping, right? Uh, that is true. Yeah. The consumer, there's no profit. That is also true, yeah. Man, you know, our, our fair share of the pie. Also true. All right. Well, you're a good Democrat. Thank you. I do know for sure, though, I have to tell you. You happen to be one of the smartest people that I've met since I've been down here. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Friedman, is there a economic system now or historically that has allowed free enterprise alone to determine which direction the economy goes? And well, second, I'm a three-part question. Okay, fine. <laughs> Secondly, in economics you have resources. And how to best use these resources is a value judgment, but it seems to me you can have either free enterprise decide or government decide or some combination, then don't you think combination would be the best alternative? And thirdly, if I can remember it, isn't there some benefit to having the government steal our money, which is what they do effectively, they hold a gun to our head and say, pay us 40% of your income or go to jail. They take this money and they give it mostly to government employees. Well, the government employees spend it. The marginal propensity to consume is pretty high. So the people who were robbed have to do something creative to get the money back. And isn't this creative activity the real wealth? Well, uh, I take it they would have to be still more creative if 98% were being spent by the government. <laughs> <laughs> now, the third part of your thing is just pure fallacy from beginning to end. <laughs> because if those people who are now government employees were employed in creative activity and productive activity, they would also be spending their money. And we'd have a greater total around. All you're doing, let's suppose for a moment, take the extreme case, that that 40% is being used just to have people uh, uh, sit around. The fact that they spend their money doesn't alter the situation. The only product there is is what the 60% produce. And that 60% is divided among the 100%. If those 40% are also producing goods, then there are more goods to go around among everybody. You are just involved in a fallacy of looking at dollars, which is important sometimes, instead of looking at the real product, the goods and services that people produce and people consume. Spending isn't good, what's good is producing. What we want to have is more goods and services. And as I say, the obvious indication that that's clear is that if your logic were right, it would apply it for 50%, 60%, 70%, 90%, 98 100%. And obviously, you would see that that would be a bunch of nonsense at that stage. It is desirable to have some money spent by government for those things, those services, that we believe we can get more usefully and more effectively through government. If people are getting their money's worth, fine. That's why it's very desirable to have governmental expenditures take place at as local a level as possible. Because you, as a citizen of a small community, can judge whether you're getting your money's worth. You can decide that you want to spend it. But when it comes to the federal government, you tend to think that you're spending somebody else's money. And you are, in a way. But he's spending yours. <laughs> All right, now let me go back uh, uh, to the first two items. Is there any example of a society in which the fundamental determination of the direction of activity was determined by free enterprise, by free competition? Of course. Most of history. Most of societies today. The government does have 40% of our income that it spends, but it wastes half of it. So that as a matter of effective matter, 80% of our resources are being determined by free enterprise now. And if I go back to the whole period of the 19th century, to the whole period of the great growth of the U.S., to Britain in the 19th century, the period when Britain emerged as a leader in the nation. At the height of Britain's power as a leading nation in the world, at the time of Queen Victoria's silver uh, jubilee in 1899, I think it was, or something, celebrating the 50th anniversary, the golden jubilee of her reign, when Britain 
when the when the Britain ruled the waves and had an empire on which the sun never set. Total government spending in Britain was 10% of the national income. So of course there have been many examples over time at which free enterprise has dominated and predominantly been the major source of determination. Today it's true in Hong Kong and Taiwan, in many countries around the world. All right, now your second question is, does not the allocation of resources involve value judgments, and isn't it better to have that values judgment shared by government and the people? Who is government? What's government? Is that something other than you and me? Is that something that us operating through a different mechanism? Who can make value judgments? Only people. Resources don't make value judgments. Governments don't make value judgments. People make value judgments. And the question is, what is the most effective way in which we as people can jointly, cooperatively, express our values? Now we express some of them individually in the family and home, separately, people, you and I alone. We express some of them by doing things for ourselves. We express some of them through voluntary groups, Boy Scouts, churches, uh, charitable organizations. We express some of them through cooperation on a broader scale on a free market, through uh, business enterprises that serve as intermediaries between people selling their productive services, producing products, and selling the product. We express some of our values through doing things through government. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, provided we keep in control and don't let the government become the master instead of the servant. And the real problem is, in my opinion, that as we move from the local community to the state, from the state to the federal government, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to control the mechanism we have established. And that mechanism tends to control us. That was the great wisdom of the founding fathers of this country of the people who wrote the Constitution. That Constitution was designed to limit government's powers in order to preserve the freedom of the individuals. And what has happened in the past 50 years is that the fundamental character of the Constitution has really been changed. We have broadened enormously the conception of what is a governmental power and what is not, and have departed from that limited government until we have created a Frankenstein, an unlimited government, that threatens to destroy us. Awesome, isn't it? <laughs> All righty. Get your calendars out. If you got a physical calendar or you got an electronic calendar, put this on. North Metro Tea Party, Jack, tell them about your next event. July 11th. You'll just be recuperating from this week, and you'll need some inspiration to get you going again. But I, I was just sitting here watching all of you. Did you think of somebody you wished that would have seen and heard this tonight? Jake, we had four people mention morality. We're going to mention it four times at North Metro on the 11th. What's next? We have the wonderful new South Metro Tea Party meeting on July 23rd. That's a Tuesday, right? And the location is? Bogart. 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 Do you know what the address is off the top of your head? Not to Google. 1497 Garrett. 1497 Garrett. Garrett. There you go. Can you paste it to one of our Facebooks so we make sure we go? Go see the South Metro Tea Party back there. In home, home of the headbanders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> July 27th, Beer and Bullets at the Metro Gun Club. Oh. Uh, by the way, Jake, you know what we forgot? We forgot to ask if there's any people that are serving in any public offices. Are there anybody here serving in public offices? Raise your hand. How about in BPOUs, serving as uh, part of a BPOU? Can you stand up real quick? Do all of you know what the term BPOU means? No. It means Basic Political Operating Unit. Organization. Organization or unit. All right? These are people that serve in the community or, the, or district. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because SD31 and SD37 are, are hosting this. 
we really believe in beer and we believe in bullets. And there's going to be paintball tournaments, a uh, tournament between the BPOUs or tea parties or whoever. There's going to be skeet shooting, trap shooting, duck tower, handgun shooting. And hopefully we get some live coverage by uh, AM 1130 again. Last year it was Jack and Ben, and I think this year we're trying to get Sue Jeffers. So it's going to be a riot. Come on over and shoot a gun if you've never shot a gun. And uh, make July a full month. <laughs> and last but not least, East Metro Tea Party is going back to Thursdays. Yay! Oh, no, I know. We just had, we had two goofy months. I mean, I, honest to God, it means a lot to me this many people showed up tonight because... You know, it's great weather out there. I know some people want to get a head start on their cabin. Some people want to go catch a fish with their hand tonight. So <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you guys coming. We're going to move back to Thursdays, and it should be the first Thursday of the month. We'll only change it if there's a scheduling conflict or a, a holiday. So East Metro's next event is August 1st. Amen. Question? Time's the beer and bullets. Oh, good it goes, Jonathan, 11 to 11 to 4. Yep, it's come as you are. You know, if you want to come over at one, shoot a little bit. Um, and just in, in case I'm continuing to be followed by the NSA, we always stamp people's hands once they start drinking beer so we can identify you from the shooters. Yeah, what, is the <laughs> what is the address on the Metro plane? Uh, if I gave you the address, it really won't help because it's, sat by, or it's sitting in behind the... Uh, Airport, the Anoka Airport, or Blaine uh, Anoka Airport. If you go to my Facebook page I, and also SD31 page, we have the address on it, right? Right. We have uh, a separate Facebook page just for the <coughs> Separate Facebook page just for the event. Okay. And right. we'll post that on uh, East Metro Tea Party's Facebook yep. page so people get that. All right, Jack, listen to that tie here. It is coming to an end. It is, it is that time. Bar time? It is bar time, the after party. Now listen. I, I thought I was going to deprive you of like 20 minutes of this fun, but I ended up going to 9 o'clock, so hey, how about that? We'd like to thank the organizers, my good friend Dave Benner. Thank you, Craig, for uh, speaking tonight. I think you did a fantastic job. Jack and Kirk, both Tea Party Pack. You guys are going to see half the stuff Kirk does behind the scenes. You probably see all the stuff this guy does behind the scenes. <laughs> Uh, but thanks for the organizers. Uh, thanks for the Minnesota Tea Party Pack. We always like to thank, uh, you know, Barack Obama, Senator Harry Reid, John Boehner for giving us the reason to organize, and uh, Governor Crazy Eyes as well. <laughs> Good topic of conversation. And the after party behind me is all those new taxes that just went into implementation yesterday: cigarettes, online sales tax. All thanks to that guy in the DFL, plus our wonderful sponsor this month, Forspective, Brand Management and Marketing Advertising. If you need some better answers, get some Forspective. Mrs. Lurkey, what do you have to say? I just, I just wanted to tell everybody, I don't know how many of you know, but over in Denmark, the country of Denmark, since 1911, they have been celebrating our 4th of July. Wow. Okay. And we have uh, congressmen and senators. Uh, Reagan was over there one time. And we have, like, I happened to be over there in 1984 with our five month old, who's a lot older now. And anyway, they celebrate this. They have like a 200 acre area. And some Danish people who had moved to America, they got together and bought this 200 acres and then they gave it back to Denmark with the idea, they gave it back to the king that they would always celebrate our 4th of July. And they do, and it's a huge celebration. They have all of our state flags up the hill on each side and then they have the Danish flag and the American flag. And now, this year, it sounds like at Fort Bragg and someplace else, we can't even, they can't even have a 4th of July uh, celebration with fireworks. That's because of the sequester. Okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, if you have any questions or want to find out more about the East Metro Tea Party, my contact info, or just come up to me right after we're done. And thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank Appreciate you. it. Bye -bye.